Welcome, everybody, to this webinar put on by um, Dynamics. This is Ray Major with Halo Business Intelligence. And uh, the topic of my, of my discussion today is going to be just the facts, ma'am, what makes data-driven organizations better? And I'd like to start first by kind of taking a look at what does make them better. And what makes data-driven organizations better primarily is that they have the ability to leverage data to do lots of different things. They're able to create better products. They're be able to increase user experiences. They're able to improve fraud detection, maximize their marketing campaigns. They're able to anticipate supply and demand conditions in different markets. They're able to mitigate risk better than other companies. And finally, they're able to have better dialogue with customers. So if you think about it, what makes them better is that they can run their business based upon information that allows them to really be able to um, benefit from the knowledge that can be derived from data to improve just about any aspect of the business. And I could end the presentation here and say what makes data-driven organizations better and give you this list and say, well, they do these things better than most other companies and we could leave it at that. But let's take a look really a little more at some aspects of this. Like, for instance, the human's need for data and, and why that is so important. I'd also like to cover what does it mean really to be data-driven after that, I'd like to cover how companies benefit from being data-driven, and then go over five steps on how you can also become a data-driven organization. So to start with, I kind of want to talk about humans' need for, for data. And some of you may remember this movie called Castaways. Castaways was a movie that was filmed about 20 years ago. And for those of you who don't, I'll just give you a little background. It's about a man who was, uh, his name is Chuck Nolan. And he was marooned on an island after his uh, FedEx plane crashes in a storm. And he's uh, by himself, and a bunch of packages have, have uh, uh, kind of drifted ashore. But he's stuck on this island. So he's got a big problem. And his problem is really that, that he needs to get off of this island. Well, he starts to make decisions to try to get off the island. So he writes help into the sand. Okay. And he does this and he waits for a passing ship to come. And he has very little data at this point in terms of where he is or how he might be able to, to uh, help himself get off of the island. And, and this is an incredibly futile attempt uh, to being saved. And as he gives up hope for that, what he starts to do is to, to kind of derive a plan to get off the island. He starts collecting data. He starts collecting information. The first thing he starts to do is to collect data on the number of days that he's been on the island. He then starts to look to see if there's anywhere, uh, any ships that are passing, anywhere that he could, uh, you know, see where he could go, like another island. And he starts to collect information on his surroundings. He starts to collect information about wave patterns, and he notices that there's a break in the, in the waves every once in a while. And if you remember the movie, there's a, uh, a, a reef that he needs to get over, and he's watching these waves to, un to try to understand the pattern of, of when he could possibly get over that if he built some type of a raft. He also knows, for instance, uh, what time of the, of the year he would have to launch a raft in order to get over that, that barrier reef. And so he starts collecting data on the sunrise, the sunset, what time of the, uh, of the year, it, year it is. And he starts to co collect information on, on making rope. If you remember the movie, there's, uh, he needs to lash together a raft, and he needs a tremendous amount of rope uh, from vines, and he starts making this rope. And here he is, uh, after he's collected all this information and built his raft looking at the, the, re the reef that he needs to go over. And if you remember, he launches the raft, and he's picked up by a passing freighter. And um, he, he essentially gets rescued, and he lives happily ever after. And this is Wilson, his, uh, his, his friend from the, from the movie, if you remember that. Now, the, the interesting thing here is that Chuck Nolan was stranded on this island without any data. And it was the data that was 
really used to allow him to get off of the island. He collected all of this information because what he wanted to do was to optimize his chances of getting off of the island. And he did that by, by understanding the wave patterns, understanding the, the, the weather, and understanding how long it was going to take him to build a raft. And he did this by, 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 by collecting this information. And it's not much different than what, than what a business does when they make a business decision. What we're doing is we collect information that we try to use to give us the best possible outcome. Chuck Nolan used the data to have the best possible outcome of being rescued. We use data to try to have the best possible outcome of things like profit or sales or customer service. So why do we really need to use data to drive decisions anyway? I think that's, that's a fundamental question that we should probably answer. And the reason we need to do this is that decisions drive business. And I would make the contention that businesses are just a collection of decisions. Each individual within your organization probably makes about 500 uh, decisions each day that affect your business. So when they first log on uh, in the morning and they start looking at their email, they make decisions whether or not they're going to answer this question or not answer this particular email, get back to this person before you get back to someone else when you're prioritizing. Um, all of these decisions impact your business at the end of the day. Now, if you multiply that out, for every 100 workers that your company has, you have about 10 million decisions that drive that business per year. Think about it a little bit further. If you took all of the people within your organization and you removed them and you replaced them with 100 uh, random people, you just took the people out who, who work there, and for each, for each person you put in a random person from the street, would you have the same business? Would they be making the same decisions? Would your CEO make the same decisions if you just picked him off the street and put him into the, the, the CEO's office? And the answer is, of course not. And the reason is that the, um, the, the collection of decisions is really what the business is. And so the, the goal of business intelligence or becoming data driven is to take those 10 million questions and empower them with data so that we can make more right decisions than wrong decisions. Because as humans, we will always be making wrong decisions, but the point is to make fewer bad decisions, and then when you do make a bad decision, to be able to quickly turn around and, and fix that uh, and, and make it correct uh, when you have the data to support that. So why do we need to have data? To, what, what, what do we need to be data-driven? So data tells us certain things. It, it tells us where we've been. So this is historical information that allows us to do things like uh, understand why the business sold as much as it did or why profit was what it was. And this comes from reporting. It allows us to know where we're going. Uh, the data within a, with, within a, within a system or, or within a, a data-driven organization allows us to understand uh, where we might close the year, uh, how much of a certain product we should be building, uh, how many of our customers are, are likely to renew. It tells us when something is going wrong. So if we are monitoring equipment, for instance, and we're supposed to manufacture a certain number of parts with uh, you know, one part per 10,000 uh, having some type of error, and that number goes up, uh, something might be wrong with one of our, our machines. It allows us to monitor that. And finally, it allows us to know when we reach our target. And that's very important because if you don't know where you're going, you don't know how you're going to, uh, when you're actually going to get there. So what are the benefits of being a data-driven organization? Data allows us to drive strategy and the direction of the organization. Data allows us to provide focus for the organization and for departments and for individuals. And we would do that by setting up metrics. It helps us make decisions because based upon that data, we can start to decide uh, when it would be time to make a certain decision, when it would be time to add an additional employee, for instance, when it would be time to do another marketing campaign. It allows us to drive performance. When we take a look at performance metrics, like for instance how salespeople are selling, we're able to do a better job of, of, of monitoring than we're able to do a better job of, of driving that performance because we can check up on it every week. It also allows us to change and evolve uh, the organization. So every organization evolves. 
Uh, it, it evolves over the course of, of, of years and even more quickly than that for fast growing organizations. And what ends up happening is that as you start to measure things, you can start to change the organization to take into effect um, it, evolutions within the company. So whether it's growth or it's changes in market or changes in competition. And this is how you have impact from being data driven. So let's take a look at some of the problems with business intelligence. Business intelligence is the uh, problem domain, if you will, of, of taking data and trying to apply it to, to the business problems. The problem that we have, though, with business intelligence is that eight out of ten companies that are surveyed are not achieving their desired goals when it comes to BI. So they have a tremendous amount of, of optimism when they first uh, think about being able to put uh, analytical systems on top of their ERP systems, for instance, and, and to really start to, to, to derive information from it. But eight to, out of ten surveyed are not achieving those goals. And What's even more telling is one out of 12 achieve their expected ROI. So with most BI projects, when you go into it, people aren't looking at this as a giant cost suck. What they're looking at it as, as something that's going to actually generate additional revenue for them. And what's happened is that only one out of 12 companies are able to get any type of ROI. And this is, this is a problem with business intelligence is that there's a lot of expense, but it's very hard for companies to, to get ROI. And when you continue to ask questions of those companies, you'll find out that two out of three of them feel that they need to improve their analytical capabilities. So if this is all true, you know, how, how, do, we, how do we overcome this? How do we be, make business intelligence uh, be more effective for a company and actually return a, har a harder ROI? What does it mean to be data driven? I think that's something that we, we, we need to talk about because being data driven is really the end goal of business intelligence. It's the ability to make decisions based upon numbers and facts rather than making these decisions based upon gut feel. Now being data driven, if you take a look at this on an axis that goes from not being data driven all the way to data driven, we have something that looks like this. At the very lowest end, which is where we're not data driven, we have organizations that have siloed data. So the data is concentrated in the hands of a few individuals. And this could be a subject matter expert who happens to own lots of the corporate data and you go to that person all the time to get that information. It could be a group of analysts who reside within a company who you go to to get the information if you need anything. It could be your finance people who have information about the financials but that data is not distributed out um, anywhere else throughout the company. But the problem with being siloed is if you don't share, then, then not everyone is using that information or gaining the value from that data in order to drive their business. Higher up on the data maturity curve is departmental data. And what happens here is when data is used by small groups of people or departments to, to drive their business. So an example of this would be a sales organization that meets on a weekly basis to go over how sales were that week, how many leads have come in, um, what trade shows they're going to and what type of returns they, they expect from those. Um, and you could also have uh, you know, customer service representatives who are sitting down and sharing data about the time it takes to get back to certain customers, uh, et cetera. And so departmental uh, would be the next level. Above that, you have enterprise uh, data maturity. And this is when data is integrated uh, into the day-to-day -day corporate operations and decision making. This is when a company has sat down and has determined what KPIs they want to look at and measure that actually help them drive their business. So what, what you have here are companies who use data every day within every department, within every, uh, for every individual, for instance, who, who, who needs data. They're, they have access to this information so they can make better business decisions. And above that, what you have is a data-driven or, or ecosystem where you have the data that resides within a company's uh, ecosystem is distributed to everybody who, who touches that company. So the suppliers, the vendors, the distributors, and the customers are all accessing that information. A good example of, of pushing customer data back uh, is Amazon. If you think about the way their website is set up, if I purchase a pair of 
of shoes or I purchase a book, for instance, it will give me uh, information on what other people have purchased or other shoes that I might be interested in based upon the ones that I purchased. So what's happening is that they're taking the data that resides in their system and they're empowering me to make better decisions uh, for myself, but in turn, they're empowering more sales for them. So this is where, where data is pushed outside of just the corporate walls, and this is where BI really starts to take on a tremendous amount of value. Um, from left to right, what you see is, is BI value. Is, is really what's, what's happening. So data-driven dis, uh, decision management is a concept that we should probably discuss at this point. Uh, and this is an approach to business governance that focuses on gathering data and analyzing it to guide corporate decision making at all levels within an organization. And this is very important because what ends up happening if you want to become a data-driven company is that this needs to be a top-down uh, effort. This needs to be supported by the senior management uh, and they need to be able to allow people within the organization to, uh, to make decisions based upon data, but mostly it needs to be a, a, uh, a, a top-down supported initiative. Let's take a look at some of the attributes of data-driven companies, and these companies typically make uh, much larger profits and are much faster growing than companies that don't uh, use data to drive their organizations. But they believe that the company and not employees own the data. And this is a mindset change for a lot of companies who have silos of information that reside with their analysts or it resides with their, their finance people or, or whoever with the salespeople. But the company owns the data, not the employee. And it's, a, it's an asset to the company if they use that data. They share the data um, by, throughout the organization by as many users and employees as possible. Okay, that's very important because you need everybody within your organization to, me, to be making optimal business decisions and the only way that they can do that is if they have access to all the information that they need. These companies also make data collection a primary activity across departments. So every department that you can think about probably has a set of metrics or data that they could collect on their performance um, with customers, on their performance with uh, internal processes, um, on, on their performance just uh, with each other, for instance, how many, uh, how many sick days are taken and that type of thing. But, the, but data collection becomes a primary activity because this data can always be pushed back and, and related to business problems. And like I said earlier, they have buy-in from the top in terms of, of using information to uh, empower the, the, the companies to make these decisions. So how do companies benefit from being data-driven? So th this really talks about where data-driven organizations see benefits. And I'm going to compare the two uh, groups, the siloed users, with those that are enterprise-wide distribution. So they're, they're the two out of the four boxes that I showed earlier. When you take a look at siloed users, what you see pretty much across the board is that there's about a 40% uh, usage where they see benefit in these very key areas. So they see 40% um, see benefits in increased productivity from their using data, uh, cost reduction, faster decision making, program improvement, and improve financial performance. The interesting thing here, though, is that those companies that have distributed the data enterprise-wide see about twice as much benefit from using the data. This is a very important point because this is where the data has value. As you can see, when it's pushed out to the enterprise, uh, there's, there's many more of the companies report having seen increased productivity or cost reduction or any of these key performance indicators. Let's talk a little bit about data-driven cultures. The data-driven cultures, uh, when you compare those two groups, the ones that are siloed and the ones that are enterprise-wide, what you'll see uh, is that there's a, a vast difference between those that mandate the use of, of analytics and those that, do, that don't. Only 7% of the companies uh, that are siloed are mandating the use of analytics within the organization, whereas 87% of the companies that have enterprise distribution have mandated use of analytics. And this is, again, this is that top-down thing where the senior management buys into being a metrics-driven organization. 
another very interesting fact is that 80% of the companies that are uh, enterprise driven are using the right metrics versus only 12% of the ones that are siloed. This is important because, uh, as I'll talk about later, in order to make good business decisions, you have to be measuring the right things. You can't just randomly collect information and push it out to people. You have to actually uh, have information that is actionable. And this requires users sitting down and really understanding what drives their business. And uh, the last characteristic of these data-driven cultures is that they promote decision-making transparency. And you can see that more than twice as many of the companies that are enterprise-wide promote the decision-making transparency. Now, this is important, too, because within companies, there's a lot of, of people who will try to protect uh, their decision-making by not sharing the data. Companies that are effective in using data put the data out there and let the data speak for itself. So if sales aren't that good in third quarter, for instance, then it's not a matter of everybody trying to defend w that they did their job and w that it's not their problem that sales are so low. It's more to that you look at the numbers and you start to understand where is the problem. Is the problem with the salespeople that we had uh, three salespeople who resigned, for instance, this particular quarter? Is it with marketing that we don't have marketing programs that are, that are sticking? Is it with uh, competition? Our competitors may have lowered their prices and um, we're having a harder time selling this quarter. What is the real reason for, for not being able to uh, make sales? And so transparency on these numbers is important. And this ha can only exist in a culture where people aren't uh, aren't beat up over the fact that the numbers are bad, but the numbers are put out there as, as, as indicators. And they, the numbers don't lie. We just take a look at them and we try to understand why and then we try to fix that. So when you look at these decision, um, data-driven decision-making um, in terms of analytic roles, you know, the siloed users, where are they seeing benefits? Where, how are they using data? They use data uh, primarily for reporting from systems. Now, reporting is really a very historical look at what's going on. Most of these reports are, are financial in nature. You, you want to understand how you finished uh, second quarter or how you finished, um, you know, how much inventory levels you have. So 70 percent of siloed users report, uh, use reporting. In enterprise-wide, nearly 90 percent use it for reporting. Um, in terms of analysis and dashboarding, and this is where many BI systems are, are are kind of uh, positioned, it's the ability to drill down into the data and to actually start to understand why. So reporting is telling you what happened. Analysis and dashboarding tells you why it happened. And um, about 60% of the siloed users have some type of an analysis or dashboarding that they use uh, in conjunction with their, their decision making, whereas enterprise-wide users, about almost uh, 80%. But where it gets really interesting is as you move to the right on this graph. Um, there is more value from a BI perspective as you move to the right and as you can see in terms of real-time monitoring. Now real-time monitoring talks about being able to see what's happening now, whereas reporting and analysis and dashboarding really talk about historically what happened. Real-time monitoring starts to talk about what's happening right now so that I can take action to fix it if something is wrong. Only 20 percent of the siloed users have a system that allow them to use that data, where almost three times as many of the enterprise users are able to use uh, BI systems or, or decision-making systems for enterprise uh, for uh, uh, real-time monitoring. Uh, when you move out even further to the, to the right and you start looking at predictive modeling, what predictive modeling talks about is what's going to happen in the future. So reporting on analytics is historical data, real time talks about what's happening right now. Predictive modeling talks about what's going to happen in the future. And as you can see here too, less than 20 percent of the, of, of the siloed users are using it for predictive modeling, whereas um, almost two and a half times as many are of, of the enterprise-wide users use it uh, to, to understand what's going to happen in the future. And finally, innovation, which is, is the furthest out there. Companies that are very data-driven collect information on a, on a regular basis and they make product decisions uh, based upon that. So they change the way that their, their, their products uh, work 
or, are, or the way that they're going to market them or the way that they, they build them. Toyota is a prime example of collecting tremendous amounts of consumer data and actually changing the way that they build automobiles based upon uh, the customer feedback. You can see with siloed users, there's less than 10 percent of those are able to, to use any of that innovation uh, in order, uh, I mean, using data to actually innovate the products that they have, whereas with enterprise users, about four times as many are able to do that. So let's talk about the benefits of being data-driven. These are some numbers that, that come from uh, an Aberdeen study. Companies that are data-driven are able to use that information to make better financial decisions, and therefore they have 34 percent increase year over year in operating cash flow. They have 42 percent increase in operating profits. They have 41 percent increase in organic revenue. That's four times the industry average in 2011 when the survey was done. And that's, that's really, if you think about it, that's a finance dashboard that they're looking at uh, from a BI system. Those who are data driven have a 40 percent increase year over year in their sales pipeline, and that's nearly triple the industry average. They have a 20 percent return on their marketing investment, which is more than twice what the industry average is. And they also enjoy 94 percent customer retention rates and 96 percent employee retention rates. When you take a look at the, the sales figure, that's your sales dashboard. When you look at the marketing investment, that's your marketing dashboard. Customer retention comes from a customer-related uh, dashboard. Employee retention is high in these companies for a very important reason. People love working for companies that are profitable, that uh, can solve their customers' problems, where, where people go to work and they feel like they're making a, a difference and they have the information internally that they need to do a good job. And they have high employee retention rates. As you know, uh, and it's no secret, that, that keeping a customer is much less expensive than acquiring a new one. It costs seven times as much to acquire a new customer as it does to keep an existing one happy. So that number is very important um, for, for customers. If you're a hundred million dollar company for every million, for every percent that you have here, that's a million dollars worth of new customers that you have to go find if you lose one percent uh, due to customer retention. Employee retention is important too because if you think about it, uh, how hard is it to hire and train and make effective an employee who, um, who, who you have to replace? It usually takes about two and a half times and the, the person who's leaving annual salary to get the new person up to, uh, to speed. So let's talk a little bit about tying data to goals. Somebody? Corporate goals. Um, is, is Okay, thank you. Corporate goals are really what data needs to be tied to. Um, when you take a look at, at data sources over here, I mean, this is really what we're trying to do. We have a set of goals that the company has. This is either to, to uh, grow our revenue, to sell a new product, to keep our customers happy. We have some type of corporate goal, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to take all these data sources down here, and we're trying to somehow take these data sources and garner information out of them that support those goals. This is really what we're, what we're trying to do. And the way that we end up doing that typically is that we start to create spreadsheets or, or other access paths into this data and we create different views into this information. And what we hope is that that data supports these corporate goals. And so I have information in my ERP system. I'm going to uh, put some kind of reporting package on there, maybe dump it to Excel, and I'm going to somehow be supporting the goals. But what we're doing is we're dumping numbers over here, right? So what happens when you acquire new data sources? Okay? What happens in the case of all of this new big data that we hear about that people want to start to uh, put into their system? Well. Typically what we would do is as we acquire each one of these new data sources, we would start to build additional views into that information and we start tying those back to the corporate goals. And what we end up with is essentially now a proliferation of ways of looking at all this information and we're hoping that they support our goals. Well, do they really? Have we solved the problem or have we actually made the problem worse? 
My contention is that this is really what's happening, is that we are pulling the data from these different systems, and some of them hit the mark of supporting the goals, but many of them don't. Much of it is just information, it's just data. And that data is not tied in any way, shape, or form to the corporate goal. It's just a reflection of what's in the database. And this is very important because in this particular case, what you have is a, a tremendous amount of effort that's being spent on collecting information, on pulling it out to try to visualize it, but it's really not helping to drive business. And this is why businesses are not getting the value out of the BI systems that they believe they should be getting, because it's not moving the needle. Okay? So let's talk about tying data to metrics. Okay? We have these corporate goals. We have these data sources. So how should this particular process be done? Corporate goals are supported by something that are called critical success factors. It's incredibly important for a company to sit down and understand what are those factors that actually drive their corporate goals. So, so if it's to become the uh, the, the low cost price leader in a certain category, if that's your critical success factor, that's what's going to, to drive you, then everything that you do, every piece of data that you collect needs to support that particular critical success factor. Now, on top of the data sources, there are business processes. There are business processes that need to be changed in order to support these critical success factors. The linkage between the two is a big problem domain that's called key performance indicators, and then business level metrics. People tend to call all the metrics that are in these two middle bars, KPIs, um, which is key performance indicators, but there are really lots of different types of indicators. There are key performance indicators, which talk about performance in the future. There are key results indicators, which talk about how things uh, look in the past. There are performance indicators and results indicators which really measure uh, the effectiveness of the business processes that need to be changed in order to support these critical success factors. So let's take a, a, a quick look at what this actually looks like. Let's say we have a corporate goal to increase customer retention rate. Okay? If you think about that, okay, yes, we want to increase the customer retention rate. Well, what we could do is we could find a data source down here and we could say, what is our customer retention rate? And our customer retention rate is 72%. Well, that's great. Is that good or bad? And the next month we measure it and it's gone down to 71%. Well, what do we do about that? Does that really, how do we make that actionable and did that really support our, what are we doing to support our corporate goal of increasing customer retention rate? The data is not tied to the corporate goal unless you start to define critical success factors. So the critical success factor in terms of being able to increase customer retention rates might be to improve customer service. Okay? In order to improve customer service, what we really want to do in terms of measurement is to measure monthly customer churn rate. That is how we're going to determine if we're improving the customer service because we have determined that if our monthly customer churn rate goes down, then that means that the customers are happier. If the customers are happier, we're going to retain more of them. So that becomes the key performance indicator that we're actually measuring. Now, in terms of that, we can, we can break that down into performance indicators, which are really business level metrics. We have faster problem solving would help reduce monthly customer churn rate having more information online for the customer to solve their own problems would help reduce customer churn rate. And if they had to wait less on the telephone, that would help that reduce customer churn rate. So these are problems that we inherently know internally within our company are happening, and we need to be able to affect these, we need to change these in order to change our KPI. Okay? Well, how do we do that? We, we, we need to set up some kind of business processes. We need to be able to, for instance, if we want to solve problems faster, we need to be able to target a resolution for a customer problem within 24 hours. Because right now we know that it's taking us three days to, to, to get back to somebody and resolve their problem. We have open tickets that, that are open for a week, for instance. We know that we've got a bunch of information we need to get online and we want to put 20% of that data up or that information up on our website every month for the next five months and then we'll have all that information there in, in, in the time that we need it to. And we know that right now on average customers are, are on hold for 20, 30 minutes. We want to reduce that 
to a two minute average wait time. Okay, these are business processes that need to be changed. If I have 20 minute wait time right now, Think about the things that I can do to change, the, change that. I can maybe train my people better to answer the questions and, and, and get off the phone more quickly. I can hire more people to answer uh, the telephones. I can come up with an automated menu so they can answer some of their own questions. But I can change business processes to affect the, the wait time, which affects the amount of time that a customer is on a phone, which helps us reduce the churn rate, improve customer service, and finally in increase customer retention rate. The data sources that I would need in order to measure these uh, factors are things like calculations from the CRM system. Uh, maybe uh, we have some kind of inventory. Uh, we have to collect all the information on all of the, the, the documentation that needs to go up. We've got to come up with a plan to push that up there. And we need some kind of, of, of spreadsheet maybe that has that information in it so that we can measure it. We also need to inter intercept the phone system data somehow so that we can pull metrics on that so we can figure average wait time. So now we know from all this data that's down here what the information is, the key information, not the terabytes of information that you're storing, but the, the key information that we need to actually impact one of our corporate goals. So this is the way that you tie data sources to company goals. Let's think about Chuck Nolan's problem. He needed to get off the island. That was his corporate goal. His critical success factor was to build a raft that was suitable to get over the reef. Okay? His KPI would have been something like being able to uh, have 120 lengths of 25-foot rope so that he could do the lashings that he needed to, and he needed to collect 100 coconuts to, with, with water in them so that he'd have some uh, time out there on the raft before a ship came by. In order to do that in the time frame that he needed, he knew that he needed to braid four 25 pieces of rope per day for 30 days. He needed to collect 10 coconuts per day for 10 days, and he'd have the stuff that he needed. If he sat down the day before he wanted to leave to braid rope, he would never have made his goal. Okay? This allowed him to stay on track because it was something that he could actually measure. Okay? He could measure it by saying braid one before lunch, braid two after lunch, and one in the evening, or something like that. So every day he knew exactly what his metric was that he had to, be, uh, he had to drive to. Every employee within your organization needs to have a metric like this that they can drive to. They need to know how many parts they need to build today before lunch uh, before they, uh, so, so that you can have the, the inventory that you need. Okay? And finally, his data sources were just local vines and coconut trees and things like that. But essentially what he did was, was very much what every business sh should do. He was successful in getting off the island because he determined what his critical success factors were and he was able to measure them and he was able to get off the island. So let's uh, switch gears a little bit to the, the last section here which talks about five steps to becoming a data-driven organization. First step, you need to define the objectives and the information needs of your, of your company. Um, this is a quote from Alice in Wonderland, which is, which road should I take, she asked, and his response to the question was, where do you want to go? I do not know, Alice answered. Then the cat said, it really doesn't matter. Uh, to me, I think this is kind of important because, well, what data do you want me to collect? I don't know. It depends on, on what you want to measure. It depends on where you want your company to go. We have to have those questions answered because it really doesn't matter what data you expose from your ERP system if you don't know what the ultimate goal is of your company and those aren't tied hand in hand. So let's talk about defining the objectives and information needs. So what are those goals that you are trying to achieve within the company? Uh, there are going to be corporate goals that you have. And this is, some, this is uh, a goal that is set by your C-level people. They, you must have a mission and a vision statement within your organization, and these goals usually tie to that mission and vision statement. And the next question that you have to ask yourself is what do you need to know to achieve those goals? So if we have a goal of, of being the low-cost price leader, we have the goal of being uh, having the highest customer satisfaction rate in the industry, we have a goal of making the, the, a larger profit margin, what do we need to know in order to achieve those goals? Okay, this kind of goes back to the pyramid that I was talking about. How will we acquire that knowledge? Where is that information go going to come from? Do we even have it within our databases right now? And who are the ultimate stakeholders who need this particular information? 
Okay? These questions need to be answered before you even start tapping into the data. One of the issues that we have uh, with business intelligence is that many of these efforts are driven from the IT departments. What ends up happening is that IT will start to uh, implement BI systems by putting views on top of the data, and they're doing a great job doing that. But really, who are the stakeholders and what do they need to know? And, and what, what exactly is the information that, that, they, that they need in order to be able to achieve these goals? So these five questions have to be answered before you can even start to uh, access any of the information within a, a business intelligence system and, and try to make sense of it. One way to do that is to employ something that's known as a balanced scorecard. And I won't go too deeply into this. This could be a presentation in and of itself. But this is a, um, this is a, f a strategic framework that was developed by Robert Kaplan and, and David Norton back in 1996. And what it talks about really is that you ha the companies have a, a vision and a strategy. And financially, uh, everybody is, has a pretty easy time defining those goals. So. What we, we know kind of what we want to do, how much we want to grow this year, for instance. But there are more dimensions to a company than just financials. There is a customer company, uh, a customer angle that we need to take a look at. Um, how do our customers have to view us uh, our, in, in terms of a business? There are internal business processes that, that need to happen in order to make these financial uh, goals happen. And then there's learning and growth within the organization that has to happen so that, that we can uh, create or sustain this vision. If you take a look at these four different categories, and this is a, one way to set up these goals that you need to become data driven, um, here we have uh, financials, for instance, is to increase shareholder value. Where there's a couple ways that we could do that, and these are kind of your KPIs, right? We, we want to um, we want revenue, we need a revenue growth strategy. We need some kind of productivity strategy. In terms of customers, we know that we need to increase quality. We need to uh, have some kind of rapid purchase process. We need to make sure that they have the right selection of goods uh, or, or, or services to choose from. You also have an internal view and a learning and growth view, and I'll let you read the, uh, the line items there. But these all come from brainstorming sessions between um, key stakeholders within the organization. So the C-level people and other managers who, who would have uh, uh, some kind of stake in this. And uh, th those companies sit down and they figure out, well, what is important to us? And they fall into these different, different categories. And what happens then is for each one of these categories, because these become your, your, your corporate goals, right? These, these are the KPIs that you're trying to, to uh, uh, measure to. It's like, well, how do you measure revenue growth strategy? Well, that kind of comes from two places. We're either going to get revenue from our new customers or we're going to try to increase our share of wallet, meaning that we're going to try to get uh, more of our existing customers to spend more money with us. Okay. Uh, in terms of productivity um, strategy, we may want to become an industry cost leader, for instance, and we may want to ex just maximize the use of our existing assets. We don't want to invest m more money and more, more equipment. And you can see with increased quality, we want to reduce the, 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 the errors per thousand. So these become things that we can now measure. Whereas the, the, the second column here, the these are the strategies. This is what we're trying to accomplish. This is how we measure them. And what you'll see with the balanced scorecard is these things start to tie together. So in order for us to create new revenue from customers, we would need to reduce the errors per thousand and increase quality. We also would need to have some kind of one-click shopping uh, set up so that we can um, have new customers have a really easy experience with, with purchasing things from us. So all of these things start to tie together. And this is when businesses start to really see value from, from, from BI or from, from data is when they have the metrics all laid out that they're trying to measure and they can start tying them together and when uh, something goes wrong, like for instance if uh, we're not shipping within 24 hours, that's going to impact our revenue growth strategy because it impacts the increased share of wallet. Well then we need to do something and make sure that we're shipping within 24 hours to meet our timely distribution goal, which is an internal process. That's how it all ties together. So who needs to know what type of data? 
Executive managers, operational decision makers, analysts all need different types of data. Uh, the information requirements usually come from the top down. Executive managers normally want to understand, they want to see how things tie back to their strategy, their mission and vision. And so they're looking at KPIs, KRIs, and financials. That's what they care about. They, they want to understand that stuff. Operational managers want to take a look at business processes and change them if they can. They're looking at performance indicators, results indicators, things like machine uptime, customer satisfaction scores. Analysts and controllers, report developers, those people need to have the ability to look at reports and analytics, create information um, based on raw data, and do all sorts of, of, of digging to understand why things are the way they are. But who needs the data and at what level is a very important thing for companies to, to take a look at before they start distributing it, because not everybody needs the same information at the same level. <coughs> the second thing you need to do is to collect the right information. So we've defined the objectives. We know what data we need. Now what we need to do is to collect the right information. Sherlock Holmes once said that, I never guess. It's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. I think this is a, a very uh, poignant point if you think about it, because when we don't have enough facts, what ends up happening is that we start twisting those facts to try to suit the theories that, that we've outlined. So collecting the right type of data. So let's determine what the right type of data is to, to answer the question. Um, we, we need to figure out what it is. Is that data in the right format for us to be able to give it to these uh, stakeholders in the, in the ways that they need to see it? If not, how are we going to obtain that data? Is it in our existing data sources? Do, is it in our CRM system? Is it in an ERP system? Is it in our point of sale system? Do we even have that information? Do we need to survey customers about their satisfaction before we can start to implement any type of process to really improve customer satisfaction scores, for instance? Is big data something that we need to include so that we can see a 360 degree view of the customers? Do we need to monitor some of our processes that right now happen without us knowing? For instance, do we monitor our shipping process? Or when, uh, do we know how long it takes or how many steps it takes? What is the, is it quantitative data or qualitative data that we're looking at? Is this, is this something that, that has numbers attached to it or do we have, is it, is it like a, a rating like A, B, C or you know, excellent or good or something like that? And if, if so, how is that information going to answer the questions that we're trying to answer with, with, within our, um, the pyramid that I showed you earlier? So a little bit on indicators. There are a couple ways to look at this. We have key results indicators and key performance indicators. Key results indicators are those that measure historical things. Key performance indicators measure what happens in the future. So where how we finished in third quarter is a key result indicator, how we believe we're going to finish 2013 is a key performance indicator. Results indicators and performance indicators are, are things that I kind of call below the line. These are not necessarily key, but these are other things that we can measure. Key indicators are crucial. They're pivotal and indispensable. That's the definition of what, what, what key means. When you look at these other indicators, these are lesser, minor, or auxiliary. It doesn't mean that they're not important, but the thing is, is that if you Google key performance indicators, you'll find tons of books that, that will give you 17,000 key performance indicators. It's import, important for you to pick the ones that you can measure and manage by. A company, it is impossible for a company to measure 17,000 different aspects of the company and, and, and try to make sense of the interactions between all of those indicators. You have to find 10 or 15 uh, things that you can measure and move forward with it. Analyze data and gain insights is step three. So data is not information, and information is not knowledge. Knowledge is not understanding, and understanding is not wisdom, and that's really where we have to be in order to make good business decisions. So data is dumb, and people are smart, and the data just sits there in the databases. So how do we work it through all these different steps so that we can actually have an understanding and, and have some type of wisdom? Well, data dumps do not equal da being a data-driven company. Just because you have access to data doesn't mean that you're going to be able to push that out and, and make sense of it. You need to turn that data into rele uh, relevant insights. You need to be able to analyze that data in all possible ways and then extract relevant information from that data. Okay? 
if you take a look at the human intelligence continuum and, and, and how people think, uh, what, what ends up happening is that data talks about the numbers, facts, and figures. That's the information you have in all of your systems. Information is really the interpretation of that data. Knowledge is what we know to be true. Inherently, we know something to be true. And wisdom talks about understanding, and that's our ability to apply knowledge to the decision. And this is really the important part of business intelligence. You have to have the wisdom to be able to make the right decisions. You have to understand, if I make this change within my business process, that I will, in fact, be able to drive my, my top line revenue, for instance. So let's just uh, do a quick uh, little test on this. So what you see on the screen here now is data. This is all data. Now, as we start to put it into context, it probably doesn't mean anything to you right now, but as we start to put it into context, okay, we start to create information. And the information starts to tell us okay, that this is probably some type of a recipe. It's our knowledge of recipes that would probably be able to tell us that this is probably an apple pie recipe, for instance. And it is our wisdom of apple pies that would be able to tell us that it tastes really good with vanilla ice cream. Okay? It also is what tells us that this is not roast duck and this is not Kung Pao chicken. This must be some type of pie. And that's because we have a context in which we can look at these ingredients and say, brown sugar, cinnamon, that nutmeg, that's all stuff that you would find in an apple pie. For our international customers, you're going to need to come up with a different uh, recipe that you can dissect and take a look at. But the point here is that the data really is meaningless unless we put it in context and we have some type of understanding wrapped around it. Now, one way to analyze data and really gain insights is to use a Six Sigma methodology. There's a DMAIC process um, that you can look up online, but essentially what it talks about is defining customer requirements or KPIs. This is something that we do with the data, to, uh, and this is what we talked about. We, we, we uh, collect the information that we, we need to understand about. We need to measure current performance. If you don't take a baseline, you don't know whether you're improving. So if what we're looking at is lead conversion, for instance, our, our, our requirement would be that we convert 50% of the leads that come into our company. Well, the first thing that we need to do is to measure our current performance. If we're at 25%, then we know our baseline in terms of where we need to improve from. And then we need to analyze the data. What is the cause and effect that would change that? What are the things that, that, that we can do to, to make those lead conversions happen more quickly or happen at all? Is it a training issue? Is it what we're saying about our, our product? We need to improve our processes, fix problems, and we need to then control improvements um, to keep us on course. So improving processes would be making sure that as we change, we continue to measure, and if things are going in the right direction, we do more of that. If things are going in the wrong direction, then we do something different. And we can also control the, um, those improvements to keep us on course. So this is how you start to become data-driven, and this is how you start to use this information to really become uh, more effective uh, in, in adding value to your data. Present and communicate the information. You can have brilliant ideas, but if you can't get them across, then you're not going to get anywhere. The data cannot speak for itself. Again, the data is dumb. It just it sits there. We need to be able to present and communicate that information in ways that users uh, have exactly what they need to make the business decisions. And we need to pay special attention to determining the most effective ways of having them visualize that information. So I showed this graph before, but these executive managers, the best way for them to see their KRIs and KPIs and how they're tied to strategies and missions uh, mission and vision statements is by having executive dashboards for them. Operational managers usually need to look at grids and graphs and drill through and things that they can they can manipulate. Analysts, for instance, need to be able to slice and dice and really get down to the to the to the very bottom level of, of the, the the data. So it could be an, an individual PO so that they can analyze what happened over there. So presenting and communicating the information in a way that the users can make the decisions is absolutely critical. 
The best way to do that, too, is to remember your target audience. You need to frame the report with some type of question. So um, this would talk about, about saying, uh, tying it back to that corporate goal of customer satisfaction. Okay, so we would we would want to always have every report that we have say this this that this report is is a reflection of that customer satisfaction score and is it going up or is it going down? Picture is worth a thousand words, so graphs are always better to use than 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 tables of data. Um, well, in the right situation, and BI tools don't solve problems. So just buying and implementing a BI tool doesn't solve problems. People solve the problems. You need to work with the people to make sure they're getting the information that they need. If Chuck Nolan had a dashboard, this is something that it would look like. He would be able to uh, take a look at all the different information that, that he needs. He, he, we can see that Wilson is happy. We know how much rope he needs to make, how many days he's on the island, what the weather forecast is, and how the waves are and the sun is. And we see when the ships are coming, and he can make a, a very good business decision based upon all this data that he has. Okay? He didn't have this particular tool. Uh, 20 years ago before it was invented, but now having BI tools, this would be the way that he could outline this and kind of see the information that he needed to. And finally, step five is making database decisions. So knowing is not enough, we must apply, and willing is not enough, we must actually do. This, um, this is the last slide that I'm going to present, and it's about holistic business intelligence. It talks about being more than just uh, to, uh, um, having data within an organization. There's, there's a technology aspect that we typically focus on, and this is the internal data sources, the ERP systems, big data, third-party data. This is where all your BI software lives, your dashboards, drill-throughs, your predictive. It's all technology, and that's just part of the equation. You have to remember the rest of the equation. Uh, processes is another very important part of this triangle. This is where we tie it to the mission and vision statement, the KPIs and KRIs. These are the scorecards that you use uh, to, to measure your business. This is the data that you collect in your, your master data management uh, processes and procedures. And finally, your people. Okay? There's, a, there's an aspect of people, the culture. Internally, um, executives, operational managers, business analysts need to have the right information and be making decisions based upon this data. And externally, you need customers, suppliers, vendors, distributors also to have access to this information. Companies that have done this well have a cultural shift that occurs and it's supported from the top. Okay? It includes all three of these. And what's very important for everyone to remember is that most of the business hard costs lie on empl employing the, the, the or deploying all of this technology. There's more business value when you start to manipulate the processes and when you get the people engaged. That's where you get the business value. So many companies have already incurred the cost and they're not seeing the value. And that looks something like this. So the cost up front for data collection and data prep is extremely high in terms of real dollars. And it's not until you start to be able to have access to that data through reporting systems, for instance, that you're able to start to see some type of ROI. But the real benefit in, in, uh, in using data is to become really metrics driven and that requires you to start doing analytics and uh, tying the KPIs back to your corporate goals, distributing that to everybody within your entire ecosystem who needs to have that information and then becoming metrics driven and being able to actually drive your business based upon on the data that you have and these cost much less than to collect the additional data. So in conclusion, what makes data-driven companies better is that they inherently understand the importance of empowering the people within their organizations to make decisions based upon data <coughs> that is systematically tied to and supports their corporate goals. I'd like to thank you very much for joining this webinar. And um, I think that at this point, our contact information is up here if you'd like to talk to us a little bit more about th these concepts or anything that has to do with BI. And with that, I'd like to hand it back over to Jason.